Hi, everyone. Let's see who we have. We're going to get started. It's about 10.58. We do want to get started right on time, um, right at 11 o'clock. So we'll wait for the others to join in and start in a few minutes. Welcome, welcome everyone. Hey, Alyssa. Hey, Mackenzie. Good to see you, Yvette. Yeah, so excited too, Alyssa. This will be a good one. <laughs> Very excited. Welcome, 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 everybody. Yeah, so we'll wait about uh, one more minute and just get started right on time um, so we can get to our exciting webinar. I do want to thank our entire team for getting this um, all together as well, including my cool green screen background here. Um, thank you, Misha. I don't know if she's on the call. Um, and she's on the webinar and thanks to our staff, thanks to Taylor for getting us all situated here on Zoom as well. Hey, Kaylin. Excited to get started. Awesome, excited to see everybody. All right, it's 11 o'clock. What do you think, Jeffrey? Um, we've got about 16 participants on. We can go ahead and get started if you're ready. Wonderful, let's begin. <laughs> yeah. Um, so welcome, 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 everybody. My name is Deborah Matez. I'm the Executive Director of Women Wonder Writers, and I just want to welcome you um, today um, to today's webinar, and, and this is our second webinar of the series, Why Words Matter. The first one was, was, was with Dr. Jamel on implicit bias, and um, today we're going to be talking about healing and narrative therapy. So the format for today is going to be a Q&A, question and answer with Jeffrey Kidd, I'll be asking um, the questions and then I'm also gonna turn it over to you all at the very end. So in your chat box, you can um, basically ask the questions or in the Q&A spot. Also on Zoom, feel free to just start typing those questions as well. Jeffrey Kidd is our current advisory board member at Women Wonder Writers. Um, he has his master's degree. He's the editor in chief at Fithia Publishing. And Jeffrey is a writing therapy trainer. We're so excited to have him. He's also one of our um, esteemed board members. So we're so excited. I'm just curious from you guys, though. Um, go ahead and type in your chat box, yes, or uh, raise your hand if you've attended a Women Wonder Writer. I know Taylor's working the polls, so just add in the poll. If, I'm curious. Have you ever attended one of our programs? Have you ever attended? Awesome. Um, so go ahead and take some time to say that. Have you ever been to one of our events or were you at our other webinars? Um, awesome, so we're gonna go ahead and vote with that. And let's see, let's see who we have. I know a lot of our team is here as well. Um, so welcome. Okay, um, excited for all of us to be here. You're in for a real treat today. Um, I'm going to be having a discussion with Jeffrey Kidd, as I, as I mentioned, asking him questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. So that's going to be the format for any questions that you have. By the end of it, we're hoping that you will have explored strategies for implementing the narrative therapy model and introducing the technique to even your family members, your colleagues, your loved ones, your friends, and most importantly, um, a lot of us, our students. Um, plus, for those that stay till the end, there's going to be an opportunity. Um, five people are going to have the opportunity for something amazing. You're going to learn more about how to go deeper with um, Jeffrey Kidd and narrative therapy. So please stay on the webinar um, and you're going to hear more about that. So as we know, as part of social emotional learning training for our Women Wonder Writer staff, we teach narrative therapy writing. Um, we, this to us, we look at it as another social emotional learning tool. And I was so blown away. We had a professional development day back in June with our staff at Women Wonder Writers and Jeffrey came to share his technique. And I've been a lifelong journaler um, since I was a young kid. 
And I began trying the method every morning, probably for the past three weeks. I've carved out about anywhere from 30 minutes to 40 minutes using Jeffrey's um, technique. And I have been able to not just do free flow writing, but rewrite my stories, especially for those nagging things that we have in our mind that are always popping up. Like, I'm a failure. Did I make the right decision? What's the next thing? way to take this organization during COVID? What's the next step for this decision in my life? And I must say, I've been completely blown away from it. So I'm a personal believer in the narrative therapy technique. So I asked Jeffrey if he would teach this technique on a larger scale, make it open to the public, and even visit our classrooms to show our youth who struggle with overcoming adversity, a lot of them struggling with anxiety and depression. So the words we write and tell ourselves really matter, but the technique and how we do it um, is really important. So I'm gonna dive right into that, Jeffrey. First of all, thanks so much for being here. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for having you. me. <laughs> and first of all, just a basic question, what is uh, narrative therapy writing? Great. So. We're all familiar with journal writing. Uh, many of us uh, write in a diary. Teachers use this as a free form writing method um, for teaching students. And it's great. We record events, we put down our thoughts. Um, it really helps clear our mind. But writing therapy and specifically narrative therapy are, as opposed to free form, are very structured practices. So there's a very um, specific process that you go through when you write and that allows you to interact and analyze with the different um, negative feelings and challenges that you're dealing with so it's very direct I like that and I like what you're saying about structure because a lot of the youth that we work with unfortunately sometimes don't have that structure in their home um, and I know sometimes even with working with kids, it's so important. And you teachers, I know we've got teachers. I see that on the line. I see a lot of awesome teachers um, on the call where um, we know how important it is when the kids come into our classroom to have that structure. So I really appreciate what you're saying there. And take us a little bit into it. I mean, how does it differ from just free flow writing? You open up a journal, you're just writing. Or you decide you want to write a poem, right? So you're inspired and you begin kind of expressing the ineffable through poetry or like a diary entry. I mean, how, how is it different? So when you write in a diary, you just write and you let it go. You can write for five minutes or 50. But with narrative therapy, and it's been around for a few decades now, there's a very specific structure in which you sit down, you write for about 15 minutes is all it takes, and you write two or three paragraphs about something that happened to you that day, an issue or a block that you're facing. And then you stop at the end of that 15 minutes and you reflect and you look back on what you've written. And then you write only two or three more sentences are needed in reflection on what that means and what your interaction is. And that really stimulates your own self-analysis and awareness. Great. And so when you say what that means, can you elaborate more? Let's just say, you know, I've, I've written about um, something that happened. You know, I had a disagreement with one of my roommates, right? Um, okay. <laughs> how do you, and, you know, in my typical journal or my old way of journaling, um, I would have just kind of vented, right? You just vent and, and this is frustrating. I mean, how do you take it where you stop and kind of say like what that means? Okay, so after you've written that 15 minutes and you've vented, uh, narrative therapy is great for disagreements. <laughs> we all go through them, they're frustrating, they're anxiety, all sorts of things. And so after you've written that for about 15, 20 minutes, then you stop and you actually reread what you've just written and you look at it and you say, what does this actually mean? Why are you mad at your roommate or your teacher or your coworker? What's the actual root of the problem that caused it? And it goes beyond diary writing in which I'm angry and it's gone, it's behind me. And you have structured reflection and trying to get more to the root of why you're angry, how you express it, um, how it manifests in those relationships with other people. 
I love this. So it's kind of like sitting in front of an actual therapist, right? That's asking you like, well, why did that bother you? Why was it? Yes. <laughs> and so tell me, I mean, is it supplemental, this narrative therapy? Um, why narrative? Is it supplemental to other forms of therapy or is it, a spe- is it for a specific type of person? Uh, so narrative therapy is um, is actually about 40 years old. It was developed in the ni- in exactly 1980. And since it was created, I've read multiple testimonies by different psychiatrists in which they worked with people that maybe there was anger or depression or fear or anxiety. And these things that we don't like to talk about as a society or even as individuals, we don't like to deal with those. And they said that when they used the narrative therapy technique, someone that they'd been working with for years, suddenly in a very short amount of time was able to work through those processes. Because instead of being told by an expert that, oh, this is what's wrong, this is what you need to do, they actually discover the root of their own issues for themselves and are able to deal with those. So it's much more effective because no one is as good of an expert on you than you. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. Like not being told, but just that process of self-discovery, right, is so much more powerful. We know that as teachers with our students, if we can help them critically think for themselves, um, it could benefit us much. We're we're more likely to kind of it for it to stick with us. Um, I'm curious, are there only certain types of individuals that benefit from narrative therapy or who's it who's it for? Uh, So narrative therapy can work for any type of individual. It can work for uh, younger cohorts like students. It can work for professionals. Um, It really doesn't matter what age or where you're from. Uh, If you are having uh, issues with your family or in school or work, these are kind of universal things that all human beings go through. And narrative therapy, when it's applied in this structured way, uh, can work for anyone. (laughs) Great. So even executives, professionals, kind of with workplace challenges that they're having could also benefit from it? Absolutely. Uh, This is a great way to reflect on barriers that uh, professionals may be experiencing in work. Uh, Maybe they're not going where they want to or they're in a different direction. Um, They're perceiving conflict within the work environment. These are great methods for working through that as a professional. Great. And then can you talk to us about some of the different techniques um, of narrative therapy? Yes, so we went through the main structure about the 15 minutes reflection and then writing based on that reflection. There's also a larger uh, acronym for techniques. It's called REDO, R-E-D-U. And I I think we have the, um, Taylor, thanks so much for being on, but can you um, share your screen with that? Can everyone see that? Just click yes on the chat box if you can see that. I love this, Misha. Thanks for creating this graph. We've got a great graphic designer at Women Wonder Writers. (laughs) So go through this, this redo. I love that acronym. So redo is the acronym for retelling your story and taking command of the narrative. It's made up of four different methods. Um, The first one are retelling your story. And this is the main overall general method for getting started. So the core of narrative therapy is that as soon as we wake up, we are bombarded by everyone else's story, okay? We get the news about what's going on in society, um, what important people in our city and country and the world are doing. We go to work and school and we hear the narrative from your teacher, your colleagues, your supervisor and coworkers. But when you uh, sit down and do narrative therapy, you are retelling your story, but you are the narrator. (laughs) There is no news anchor or uh, supervisor or like that. You're the expert on yourself and you're telling it from your point of view. Um, And you're pushing back on all of these uh, different factors that you're getting from society. Okay, so that's the R part. Is there something more beyond that of externalizing or I see... um... Yep. So the R, the retelling is, is the, the broad method. Now, when we go more focused and then uh, you get more familiar with that, you can do the E, which is externalizing the problem. Very often we, and it's just the structure of our language, we tend to think of problems in terms of ourselves. So if someone's angry, they say, 
I am an angry person. And maybe we hear it from other people. They say that, oh, uh, Jane Smith, you're an angry person. But when you externalize the problem and you're writing, you take that anger and you put it over here. And you don't say that you are an angry person. You're just a person. You put the anger off to the side and you say, what does that anger look like? Does it look like a raised tone of voice? Does it look like becoming quiet and frustrated? Um, what are the different parts of that anger? And uh, therapy has shown, sorry, research has shown that when you externalize these different features, you're able to deal with it better because instead of it being an inherent problem within yourself, it's something over here that's manageable and that you can address and deal with. I like that. And I guess you can even kind of draw it too, to some extent, you know, I've seen this with children where they may draw what that feeling looks like or what that experience is almost like outside of um, their body as well in some capacity. Absolutely. Um, the, it can externalization is not just with uh, prose writing. You can do it through poetry, painting, drawing. I mean, there's really lots of different ways you can do it. Uh, a really wonderful way, especially with students, is you can have like a watercolor exercise where they can put and externalize whatever that negative feeling is. And then they can even use the paintbrush next to it and write down different words of what that means to them, of what sadness or anxiety, what it looks like. And you can mix and match the different mediums together. I love that because sometimes, you know, like you're saying, we define ourselves by our thoughts or our feelings of, oh, I'm a depressed person or, oh, I'm like you're saying, I'm a very angry person, but this kind of puts it outside of us and doesn't define, um, which I could see having the value of self-esteem and self-worth um, if we know that it's something external to us. And what's this D uh, when you were deconstructing the issues? Okay, so D uh, and the deconstruct method uh, goes well once you've mastered the externalization. So you can see that this redo, they each kind of work into each other as you get more familiar with narrative therapy. So when you deconstruct, so after you've externalized the issue and it's over here, then you can deconstruct its pieces. So we use the, uh, the example of anger. Let's use the example of anxiety. So we put anxiety over here. We said that, okay, when I'm anxious, maybe I don't speak up or the student uh, doesn't share and they kind of close down. But then deconstruct is when you really get into the components of why they shut down. So it's not just that I shut down because I'm an anxious person. You're not an anxious person. Anxiety is over here. <laughs> and anxiety looks like you shutting down. Now, what are those individual pieces, okay? Do you shut down because you're afraid of what your peers might think about what you say. Um, you feel like maybe you have a minority viewpoint within the workplace that your colleagues will disagree with. And you really look at the individual, and that's when you get to the real heart of the issue through this structured reflection on what it is that those small pieces are. And once you understand those, then you can really start to uh, come up with different answers and solutions of how you want to move forward. But I'm skipping to the you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like this because it's really, you know, having the individual examine their behaviors, right? And their, their habits of how they behave when they're feeling this thing of, you know, let's just say anxiety. Um, is there ever a time, because I know you mentioned before that we had to um, kind of tell, be our own anchor people or narrative or, you know, person that's telling the story, but is there ever a time where somebody may ask a trusted friend or colleague or ally, you know, how do I get when you see me get anxious? Like, I mean, are there, is there ever a time where people just aren't aware where it's helpful to get other people's input or are we really just focusing on a self-evaluation and introspection? You can definitely use other uh, trusted people as a resource. But with narrative therapy, you only want to do that as a supplementary action. Uh, the core of this type of writing therapy is that you are the expert. And as soon as we start to introduce other people, uh, whether a spouse, a close family member, a confidant, or a good friend, 
as soon as we start to do that, uh, research shows that we start to write and change our narrative for what they want and what we think that our spouse uh, looks at us or our friend or our colleague. And so if you wanna do that because you're having an absolute roadblock and you're having difficulty moving forward, then you could use that as a starting place. But really the essential goal is that you are writing for yourself alone and that you're writing with the intention that no one is ever going to see this except for yourself so that it's not influenced by society or by others. It's really focusing on you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. And now we're um, to the you. This is my favorite part because I think it's the most, what's so different about just regular free flow journaling. Um, tell us about this unique outcomes theory. Yes. So unique outcomes theory, the you and redo, the, the fourth and final method is when after you've deconstructed the different parts, you look at what those are and how you can find alternatives to them. So if we go back to the example of the anxious student and they're not raising their hand, they're not participating in class, maybe because uh, they feel that other people will laugh at them or be judgmental of what they say. And maybe that stems from something at home. Maybe they have a very judgmental home environment where one of the parents or both parents are not very supportive of them finding their own voice. Then with unique outcomes theory, they're able to write and envision a new way of how the situation would unfold. So if that day in class, they didn't speak up out of anxiety, then within the narrative therapy, they would come out with a new unique outcome in which they would ask themselves, what if I did speak? <laughs> what if I did raise my hand and I shared with the class what I thought? Would they really all laugh at me? Would the teacher intervene? Or maybe some friends would speak up for me? Or maybe it would go fine. And they, it's not uh, creating a fiction narrative. It's just exploring alternative possibilities of what could happen. And like you said, it's very powerful because we constantly have negative feedback that we hear from others and that we even hear from ourselves. And when people start in a structured manner to envision different outcomes that have a positive impact and that could have positive outcomes, that where things could go right instead of going wrong, then that builds the uh, mental pathway for them to actually do that in person. Okay, so now, you know, at the end of it, they've explored these different options. Maybe I should have spoken up in class. Um, is there any level, because I see some of my, my um, district attorney colleagues, I see Evelyn, hey Evelyn, Patty, pardon us. We're big on, um, and me being a prosecutor myself, we're kind of big on accountability, right? We want some outcomes or we want the kids to kind of actually change behavior in some regards. Is there any correlation or connection between writing down possible outcomes and actually maybe trying those things out. So the next time they're in class, that they actually speak up a little bit. Is there any level of accountability in this or how does that student actually begin to put into action those other possible outcomes? Okay, so when people, when individuals use the narrative therapy, there has actually been for decades now research showing that when they are resolving their own obstacles, their own fears and different challenges that they're facing, they're much more highly motivated to implement those changes than if someone else is telling them. Um, if an expert or a professional, um, a parent or a boss or a teacher is telling them this is what's wrong, this is how you fix it, maybe they implement it, maybe they don't. But with narrative therapy, there's a very, a large individual self-motivation that uh, pushes them to do that because it's from their own resolution. They came up with it, um, they figured it out, and it's up to them to, to put it into practice. It's also great for accountability because with narrative therapy, like we spoke earlier, we are taking all those different factors from society and 
that we feel like are blaming us and pushing us into a certain box. And we're saying, no, <laughs> okay, enough is enough. I'm looking into what I'm doing and I will figure this out. And when we do that, we take accountability for ourselves. We look at the different obstacles we're facing and we're seeing what we can do as an individual to overcome those different challenges. Um, there's some things in life that admittedly we can't do. <laughs> um, after all, we all are human. Uh, but for the things that are um, concerning uh, mental health and our strengths and our different actions and choices that we make in life, uh, those things are within our control. And those, and narrative therapy is placing those and making us responsible for the choices moving forward. So if you envision the unique outcome and you look at those hidden uh, alternative endings and you reveal those to yourself, suddenly you can't say, I'm anxious and so I don't dare speak up in class because you now know why you're anxious. You know what it looks like, you know where it's coming from. And you also know that there's a possibility to have an alternative reaction the next time that you're in class or at work. Yeah, I mean, this is great. I think that's why we saw such the connection um, to the right of your life also. We do a lot of exercise and I see a lot of our teachers on um, from the right of your life where we talk about personal accountability, right? And that you only have control over what, you know, your two feet are here, right? Put a hula hoop around you or, um, you know, that's the only thing you have control over and not you know, kind of other people's actions. Um, so I love that personal um, accountability aspect and only controlling what's within your control, really, especially because our kids have so many things going on around them that are outside of their control. And as, as a side note for everybody, um, we're so excited. We're going to be test piloting the right of your life virtually. Um, our platform is going to be ready in just a couple weeks. So um, just as a side note, if, if you want to be one of the first 12 people to try it, either as an adult taking the ride of your life, a student taking, you know, a youth taking the ride of your life, or even teachers going through the ride of your life, which is our flagship program, drop your email or phone number in the chat box right now. Um, if you want to be part of the pilot to get a discount um, and you can, one of our staff will reach out to you tomorrow. So just type your email, your phone number, um, if you want some more information about doing the ride of your life virtually with us online. Um, but back to the the narrative therapy and that personal accountability is this something because i know you mentioned earlier like if you start getting feedback from your spouse your significant other it may actually change right the personal narrative story um is it only for individuals then or can couples do it for example to resolve problems or can families do it together or can teachers do it with their student groups um i'm sure that it could be applied uh, to larger group settings, but it's, uh, it was developed and intended specifically for the individual. Um, so if the, uh, a spouse couple or a family or a student teacher group would like to use it, it would be best to use in the setting of uh, teaching the tools for each individual within the family, such as like parents to children or teachers to students and how they can utilize it in dealing with uh, the different conflicts and challenges that they experience. Um, but as such, as soon as you start to include different people in telling one story, then you have the same kind of conflict arising in which you're getting different narratives that are coming in and they're influencing. And as some are spoken, others go unspoken because there's only a finite amount of space that these can all be said. So it's definitely great um, within the group setting and teaching different tools so that the individual can use it. And how important, you know, when we're, we're kind of writing our stories, especially in this kind of sacred way, I would call it, um, you know, a lot of kids fear, right, that somebody may have access to their journals. You know, we've been told that also where they're reluctant to kind of, is there an important part of safety or if you're at home or, you know, even a spouse can see it. Sometimes we have victims of domestic violence um, that we work with as well. Um, I know when I was a kid, um, I didn't journal totally truthfully because I had this fear that my parents might find it, even though I had a Woody Woodpecker diary with a lock on it. It's still like, you know, it was like this idea that someone was going to come into my room and find my 
personal thoughts, is there any element of safety we should be aware of um, when we're telling the truth in our narrative therapy practices? Yes, that's a great question. And when we look at these different therapy ideas, we also have to think about how we implement them into practice and how we make this happen in real life. And privacy is a really key component in that because as soon as you start to worry that your parents or spouse or, or a sibling might start reading that, you start to edit your own thoughts. And then we go all the way back to before the beginning in which we're getting these other influences rather than looking at ourselves uh, wholly. And so uh, there's different ways to do this. Um, you can always uh, tell and set that boundary. That's a great practice um, for improving self-confidence is going up and setting that boundary that this is a private item in which it is not okay that the uh, parent or spouse or sibling uh, accesses. And it could be said in a, in a very, um, you know, appropriate way, especially from children to parents. <laughs> um, but they can definitely set that boundary. Um, another thing, if they're still afraid of it, there's a wonderful website, it's called penzoo.com. And it's meant just for this. And what it is, is it's an online journal website, in which you have an account, it has a secure password, and different safety features. And you can write in there and put down these practices and ideas. And then as soon as you're done, it's locked. And it's locked uh, digitally until you uh, go back and unlock it yourself. So other people cannot access it. And that's great, especially in modern times where even children uh, have computers and phones with internet. That's something that they can all use if a physical journal um, still gives them some worries. Great, thanks for that little hack. I put it in the chat box to penzu.com. Um, and also it may just mean teachers not collecting this as work or journals because we explain to the kids that this is for them, it's not, you know. But oftentimes we also find at the right of your life that they wanna show us their work, they wanna show us they're really proud of kind of their own personal growth as well. So I think it's all based on relationships, um, but privacy being of utmost importance, especially to the kids. Um, does this, Jeffrey, I mean, do you have to be, you know, a, a therapist? Um, does this only need to be practiced with a professional? Um, or what are some practical prompts or techniques um, that anyone can try to help ease their anxiety through this method? Uh, so the first part of that, uh, you do not have to be a professional in order to do this for yourself. You also uh, do not have to be a, a specially licensed type of say like a psychiatrist or a therapist in order to uh, teach these tools to others. They're very readily available. Um, digital access gives us a lot of information about really core techniques and we can look up uh, not just general information but very specific research and studies and methods that have been proven over time to work. Uh, the If you were to use it though, like if you were, <laughs> to use it as like a one-on-one -on -one setting between like a professional and an adult or youth client, then of course you would need a uh, professional psychology licenses. But in the manner in which we're using it, it is um, general and broad enough to be conveyed as tools to share that others can use. Okay. And I kind of want to go back to something you mentioned before of this idea of um, separating individuals from maybe an action that they took or a mistake that they made um, or something they did, even a crime for that matter. Um, an addiction is like another example that someone may have um, that they're struggling with or even a disability, you know, some sort of mental health disability, depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, all of these things. One of the things you talked about was the importance of separating themselves. Can you elaborate a little bit um, more about that? Why it's so important, um, especially with the, the students and the youth that we're working with? Sure. So the example of a minor who committed a crime is, is a wonderful um, and a very uh, relevant example of that. So oftentimes in the way our society is and how expansive our society's view is of what constitutes a crime, uh, a youth, a minor, might commit something that is a crime and they're labeled as a criminal. 
And the way that it works is that they have that criminal label for a long time, um, especially depending on what crime they committed and it follows with them. It determines job outcomes and housing and all manner of things. And it could really give and determine their entire future story. And so this is a great uh, example of when to use narrative therapy because they really need to separate that they committed one action that might have only been 30 seconds. And that doesn't define who they are as an individual. It doesn't define the next 60 or 70 years of their life. And so when they do that, they use these different methods that we've discussed and they put the action of that crime, they externalize what led up to it, they deconstruct the different components. Okay, was it this part of my life? Was it the peers I was hanging out with? Maybe they can look up unique outcomes, like what if I hung out with this different group, or maybe I was a little less sociable in this environment, and these different outcomes. And not only does it come up with different means of how to avoid future actions that could turn into mistakes, but it also gives them responsibility for their own life. And it's taking that away from society and saying, you're a criminal, or in their friends saying, you need to commit this crime to be cool or fashionable. And instead it puts that, that you're the narrator and this is your story. And if you wanna to continue to commit crime, that's up to you, but if you don't and you wanna put those mistakes over here and work through them, you're gonna be a lot better off on this end of your story. Right, right. And that's, that's a wonderful example. And I just reiterate, you know, to anybody who's working with those, you know, we also at Women Wonder Writers work with um, adult males who are impacted by incarceration over at Chuckawalla Valley State Prison, as well as um, California City State Prison. And one thing we always disclose to them is we give their, you know, kind of the creativity disclosure. It's almost like a Miranda rights for artists, because it is very serious. And, and sometimes, you know, if they're going to be writing about crimes, that they've committed that they may actually be um, pending cases and that kind of thing. It's important to warn them about kind of their rights or once something is published out in the world, even if it's on a blog, for example, that people are writing about things that people can perceive certain things about them. So again, I emphasize the ne necessity and need for safety and security for these types of um, kind of journals that are gonna be written. And again, um, Jeffrey had kind of shared penzu.com because the narrative therapy process or any writing process should be therapeutic, not putting them in a position where they're going to incriminate themselves or somebody's going to get a hold of something that they can interpret that's going to further um, put them in a, in a worse situation. But nonetheless, I mean, defining these things, another one I've heard is, you know, addicts, a lot of times, you know, they'll talk about family members, the addiction is outside of them so that people can, family members can understand and assist that person. Um, with that addiction that they're struggling with, um, sometimes looked at as like a disease. So again, this idea of separating um, oneself from that, which is so important in the, in the narrative therapy process for somebody to move past this. And there's so many stigmas. We've even heard some of the biggest fears of our incarcerated is just that stigma that they're exposed to as a result of maybe having committed a crime. Um, so narrative therapy um, helps to stop assigning fault kind of to yourself or to other people. Um, how do we, you talked a little bit about this, about the accountability aspect um, that also helps keep us accountable, if I'm understanding correctly, Jeffrey, that if we're our storyteller and we're coming up with different outcomes of the way we could have handled things, essentially it's almost personal accountability. Is, is that what you're saying? Very much so. It places you in charge. Um, like you were mentioning the last example of the addict. If someone or even all of society is constantly telling someone that they're an addict and they need to fix themselves, they're always going to be hearing in their mind that they are an addict. <laughs> mm. But if they externalize that issue and they put the addiction over there, they work through it. And they envision those different outcomes of what if they didn't have an addiction? then that puts them in charge because they see that option. They've envisioned it, they've written about it and reflected on it in a structured manner in which this is how I would do it, this is what it would look like in practice. And uh, those 
are the ways in which they could take responsibility for themselves because now no one else can say, oh, they're an addict, they're gonna be stuck like this forever. It is now up to them which of the different pathways in front of them that they want to take. Great. And at Women Wonder Writers, you know, we're always measuring resiliency. We even have, you know, a 32 question instrument pre and post test that our kids do. We're constantly, and resiliency to us is the number of factors, including hope, finding purpose, um, peer and family support is another one, empathy, uh, self expression, expressing yourself in a really healthy way, and self esteem. We always have those five categories that we're always addressing. I know all my um, teachers on the line, you know, could probably cite them by. Yeah by memory at this point, but how does narrative therapy um, tie in with resilience? So resilience is a wonderful idea and it's been used very well. And uh, when you use narrative therapy, you're enhancing resilience. So we're, we get worn down by society. We turn on the TV, we get notices on our phone from news and work and like, oh, this happened at school and this happened with your spouse's work and all these are things. It wears us down. We only have so much energy and so much resilience uh, that we can work through and that we can tolerate every day. And so therapeutic writing and specifically narrative therapy gives us a tool to recharge, to bring back and uh, rise up our resiliency levels at the end of the day, where you can go through these different things and work through them and uh, decide how you want to better combat them tomorrow. So it's great that. for improving those different factors that you mentioned. Wonderful, and I'm gonna ask the audience, go ahead, type your questions into that Q&A box you see or in the chat box, I'll pick them up for you and ask Jeffrey any questions that um, he has as well. And again, that you know, confidential website, penzu.com that he mentioned so important to protect the safety of our thoughts. And um, go ahead and type in your questions though. Um, tell us a little bit, Jeffrey, about the proven effects of narrative therapy. I mean, are, they, are we seeing results with this? Yes, so there have been proven mental and physical results from narrative therapy over decades of research. So we've talked a bit about the mental health aspects and I wanna go into those health benefits first. Um, the four major uh, negative feelings that we experience, okay, fear, anger, depression, and anxiety. This is proven to mitigate the effects of all of those. People that have had uh, uh, over compulsive disorder, OCD, or a lot of uh, minors presently have ADD or ADHD. And a lot of times people want to go straight to medicine or, or maybe they just don't have a way to deal with it at all and they say like there's something wrong with the child when there isn't and this allows that child to actually go through and get to the root of the problem in which they're in charge and it's proven very effective um, for eliminating OCD, ADD, um, reducing the instance of panic attacks and uh, symptoms and feelings of depression. It's been proven when used correctly to handle all of those things. Now, for an individual incident, it can have effects. Uh, if you use it, the 15 minute structure, you write 15, 20 minutes, reflect and respond. That has demonstrated for people to be able to go it over smaller, maybe localized incidents. Uh, it only takes about three to four days of writing um, to get over a localized incident. Now, as far as chronic issues go, um, they say it takes longer. This is something that should be done for about three to four months, um, but it can help overcome and improve different faucets of mental health for the individual. Um, there's also, and this is a really exciting part because we think writing is, is very much a mental and emotional exercise, but there are actual physical health improvements that this can give and different benefits that they can give us. Um, and we think writing, how can that do that? But it can by changing the quality of our mental state, it actually improves our physical health. Um, narrative therapy has been shown to improve dieting and eating habits. Um, maybe people are so stressed out or anxious that they aren't able to eat enough or make healthy choices in their diet. And this improves that. Um, it also helps with sleeping. 
um, a very large number of children and adults um, have problems and uh, they report issues with sleeping, waking up, not getting enough. Um, this can actually improve the quality of sleep that we get. Um, it also has uh, shown effects for our blood pressure and our heart health. <laughs> um, stress is actually a major factor um, with like hypertension and heart disease. And stress is in a very large way uh, controlled by the way that we process it through our mind. And so proper and long-term narrative therapy can actually help address those physical problems too. Whoa, this is a big deal. I mean, one of the <laughs> one things I've only heard that kind of fixes the stress response and all these things you're talking about um, is meditation, which is another thing, but it almost seems like to have very similar benefits of those which we know. I mean, by the time our children reach us in the, in the criminal justice system or even alternative ed, those kinds of things, we know they've been impacted by at least four adverse childhood experiences, which oftentimes lead to these public health concerns, the depression, the anxiety, the vascular disease, the autoimmunity disorders. So wow, what, what a wonderful prescription for the universe, right? I mean, narrative therapy writing. Um, so I'm gonna go to the, Q, I'm gonna go to the questions from the audience. Um, Paola, welcome, welcome, and I'll, answer, I'll have him answer live, but what time of day do you recommend using the narrative therapy first thing in the morning, end of the day? Okay, so for me personally, I like the end of the day um, because I have the most energy in the morning and then it just, I kind of lose it as the day goes on. And so it's great for addressing all those things I went through, but really narrative therapy needs to be tailored to individual preferences. So if your space where like you have that time and quiet and peace and focus is in the morning, then that's when you should do it. Or maybe it's uh, your only peaceful time of the day is like midday, maybe like during a lunch break, then you should pick the time based off of your own schedule. Uh, set a timer, set it for 15 minutes on your phone, there's app for it, and just write. Write it down 15, 20 minutes, where no one's gonna disturb you. You can even ask your colleagues or wherever you're at, like, don't disturb me. Preferably do this though, where you're by yourself. And then write until that timer goes off. And then do the reflection and then the response to your own writing. Wonderful. And then we also have Belia. Um, does this therapy work only in the narrative form? I've been crazy busy during this difficult time, but I've noticed that using this redo in social media and writing to family and friends, I feel like it's been helping um, having a better communication and less anxiety. So um, does this therapy only work in narrative form? Well, that's really wonderful to hear. Uh, I've only um, practiced it and then retaught it in the individual uh, writing form that we've discussed. But if you've been able to use that as a way to structure and enhance your communication and reduce that anxiety, then I say right on. <laughs> uh, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, great. Congratulations on that, especially during this crazy uh, COVID time. I know a lot of our students are reporting anxiety, depression, um, and I think it's just general overall um, with adults as well. Yvette, Yvette, so happy to see you. Yvette's one of our instructors at Women Wonder Writers. How often should we write? Um, so we kind of answered that daily is what I'm hearing. Um, she's asking if you could do it a couple of times a day and then how can we motivate our young middle school girls um, to engage in this therapy to address self-harming behaviors? Okay, uh, so there's three parts to that. So the first one, um, I would suggest once a day. Um, that's what the research has all been based on and it's proven to be very effective. If you'd like to write um, more than that, then I would suggest writing it within one session, but just writing longer rather than having um, breaks in the narrative throughout the day. Instead of like having like uh, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 in the afternoon, 20 at night, I imagine it would be better to do a 60 minute session just in the evening. <laughs> Um, so that's the first two items. And the third part was about uh, middle schoolers. Yeah, anything with our middle school girls to encourage them to use this form of therapy um, so that they, we can address kind of their self-harming behaviors. 
Sure. Uh, so there's a couple different things that could be done um, to get their interest from the very get-go because getting children's attention can be difficult <laughs> for any parent or teacher knows. And so get their interest. Um, if you want them to have their own journal or you want to provide journals, get really interesting journals with like really bright, colorful covers, um, like different kinds of pages, some with lines, maybe some with outlines so they can doodle in it. I mean, just really get them to love that journal <laughs> and to be excited about it. Um, That's such a good, that even works for adults, you know, every time, you know, usually people get yes. me with journals and it's so exciting. <laughs> exactly. It's like you, you can see, you know, like a dollar notebook or you can get like a really nice leather bound, you know, like there's all different things and patterns and that's great for adults too. Um, as far as because they're middle schoolers and you're doing this um, as a teacher, you could either have them um, do it within the classroom and then leave a secure space for that journal to be if they don't want to take it home. Um, if, they, if you just want to keep it as an academic exercise, then you could have that secure place in which like their name is very prominent, that's their journal and you keep track of the uh, integrity of those journals within the classroom. Um, Wonderful. That would be a definite way to do that. And also that ties into something you said earlier, Deborah, about how students um, can uh, practice the narrative therapy within the classroom without having that influence that, oh, I'm going to share that with um, my classmates and it's going to be judged and therefore I need to self-edit it. I think a great resolution for that is they could have a journal just for the narrative therapy that's just theirs. No one reads. It's not going to be shared. And then as an academic assignment that can be measured and graded, you can have them write on a separate like a piece of paper, um, a different activity sheet on aspects that they want to share but it's keep it physically and therefore mentally completely separate from the integrity of that original narrative therapy journal. I think that would be a great way to delineate these, those two different aspects. Great, more questions coming in. Um, okay. And we'll kind of wrap up with the last three here. Um, Patty wants to know if there is any sort of journal or something to keep us on task, like a, you know, a, a, a journal that has this narrative therapy kind of method within it that we can use. That you're familiar uh, so there, with? <laughs> that's actually that's a great question. That's a good idea too. Um, no one has done that yet. Maybe that's something that women wonder writers that uh, we could take on and you could <laughs> uh, formulate. Uh, but no one has made something like that yet. Um, there are so many different writing therapy prompts. You can find lists of like hundreds and hundreds on Pinterest. A quick Google search will find you. <laughs> yes, we should do it. <laughs> we should yeah, make one. Yeah, yeah. We have Patty saying, yeah, do it. I'm yes, going to rope you into that project, Patty. <laughs> um, actually, Misha yeah, is on the call. No one uh, yet she, has done it, they're but publishing. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, go for it, Misha. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then we also have um, Belia coming back with another question. Her 10-year-old struggling with um, not being able to sleep, almost to the point giving melatonin. She has dyslexia as well. Um, is there, how can we motivate student, her to write um, about what frustrates her, especially because she doesn't like to write? So I think we got some good suggestions. Anything else that comes to mind? We have the fun journal, um, anything else? Yep, so there's definitely the fun, exciting journal. Um, you can even like take a bunch of different types of journals and have the students uh, pick out which one they like so that there's that element of choice and self-motivation in that and determination. Um, for her, maybe you could get that particular student a very special journal um, for her. Um, me personally, on a personal level, if I may share this, I would prefer if it was my child at that age to use narrative therapy rather than melatonin or a different sleeping aid so that they could actually work through that because um, such a, a sleeping aid is only really a band-aid and it will never get to the true root of why at 10 years old she's having difficulty sleeping. Um, you could definitely, and I would encourage you to try the narrative therapy and try it consistently once every day, 15, 20 minutes and consistently. And 
uh, even at first, if she's resistant to it or not doing much, I think over time, um, she would definitely have an interest in it. And there's different ways to help motivate children through that. Um, if she's absolutely against writing, there was the different methods we talked about earlier. You can use watercolors, finger painting, um, like all different types of art. Uh, maybe uh, if it's really outdoor and the weather's permitting, maybe use sidewalk chalk. <laughs> maybe, yeah, I mean, like, they're all really wonderful creative ideas. With it. <laughs> I know also, Belina, there's another group, um, I'll get it to you offline, but they actually uh, help kids write their own children's books. Um, and I know being a children's book author myself for the ages four to eight, reading with the kids and actually they kind of have a self um, how to do their own children's books. So I'm wondering if she may be able to participate in a program like that. Um, but our heart goes out for you. Also, um, another caller wanting to know if, um, and narrative therapy has been used to uh, deal with grief and loss from traumatic experiences, um, such as family, you know, breakups, pre and post COVID world, institutional oppression, a lot of the, you know, family pet issues of passing away, um, and better navigating micro and macro systems on an individual level practicing this. So is this something we could use for kind of anything going on in life, Jeffrey? You definitely can. Um, like we mentioned earlier, if it's a more uh, localized incident, um, and that's not to impugn what happened, just that it's more of a, a very specific uh, circumstance, like say a breakup, then it, you can still use narrative therapy, but it would be a much shorter duration, um, oh, depending on the length of the relationship, of course. If it's um, something more chronic, uh, or more grave, like the passing of a close family member, or this um, burdens and pressures we're feeling on society because of different structural issues, um, then that would be, uh, would take longer. That would be like the three to four month window in which you're really working on and focusing on that subject. Um, it's not something that you would expect to just do for a couple of days and you say, ah, I feel so much better. That would be something that um, because we're so attached to that individual that we lost um, through the family death, or because we are so um, conditioned from the different societal factors over years of our life, it would take a longer period um, to work through those. But narrative therapy can and has been proven to be able to work through those things. Um, it can really be adapted to all manner of different scenarios. Okay, perfect. Now, um, I know there's so much to go into with this, um, Jeffrey, I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it. And I mentioned at the beginning, everybody audience that there would be a bonus at the end. So type yes in the chat box. Um, if, if it's okay to discuss what it would look like going a little bit deeper and working with us on this topic. Um, so go ahead and if it's okay to kind of dive into that next for just briefly a couple minutes. Um, Go ahead, type yes in the chat box. Um, great, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, <laughs> wonderful. And so it's great to sit on a webinar like this, right? We even had um, somebody who attended late. I'm sorry um, that you couldn't hear this. This will be recorded and available, though, on our website. So um, just look for that there. And maybe you've learned a couple things, but it may be unlikely that you're actually going to implement these things or work with your students or your family members or your daughters um, or whoever it is that you think would benefit from this narrative therapy. Um, you can also bring it to your classrooms or to your, um, the students that you're ab advocating for. And what can really affect change, right, especially when some of these issues like grief and loss and death are at, are at stake or crime, um, a full six-hour live and interactive training where Jeffrey trains you in person either virtually, like in this type of setting, or your group of professionals that want to really dive in and go deeper on this particular method or he can come to you as well. And during this training, um, up to 50 people can engage in reflection exercises, examining their limiting beliefs, which we all have. Even as an, an entrepreneur executive, I, I still have those limiting beliefs where I beat myself up. Um, and this can include breakout sessions as well, either online, um, we have that capacity to do that as well. Um, you'll be examining the key components of narrative therapy, examining ways to actually teach narrative therapy to others, and then examining strategies um, to measure the results of your writing or your teaching, 
And you'll also have access to our online group circles at Women Wonder Writers for support up to 12 weeks where you can actually implement these strategies that are learned during the training. Um, you know, after Jeffrey, I told you he was able to come in and really teach our staff, but we were actually able to train up 10 of our staff members who are going to be working in fall um, directly with our students around the topic of narrative therapy. We were actually able to explore a lot of our limiting beliefs as a group and even as an organization. Um, so we were actually able to uh, train 10 people in this area, which gave a rewarding professional development day. Check, you know, check yes, because I know some of our um, teachers were on, was it rewarding to you having, I know personally, I get up every morning and I'm in my hammock um, journaling using this particular um, therapy style, so I can also vouch for it. But we're actually in the process of adding a lesson plan to our curriculum, specifically involving the right of your life with narrative therapy technique for our students that we work with. Um, so it's a really good way. This also, this commitment has enabled us to reach more students virtually with a new tool in our SEL toolbox. Um, so if your company or agency or school or anybody can use this narrative technique, please put in the chat box your phone number, your email, and we'll have our staff follow up with you tomorrow. And there will be a limited opportunity for five of our um, kind of for at a discounted rate to be able to take part in this. And sometimes also, you know, nonprofits or some institutions that don't have a lot of funding for this type of professional development or for their students, they can actually band together on the same class and actually share part of the expense. And we know um, that, you know, narrative, let's help have narrative therapy long before there's indecision, limbo, fear, anxiety, depression, getting the best of us. And we fall prey to misbelief, you know, misbeliefs about ourselves and our situations all the way from us down top down to our, our students as well. And part of our managing our um, emotions we know involves this introspective process where we have to hold ourselves accountable. Um, and narrative therapy is one of the solutions for that. Schools can actually gain from each student improving their emotional quotient, that ability that kind of stops them from making decisions that are harming themselves with this technique. Students and employees can resolve um, to explore their limiting beliefs and histories by writing a new story. So it does have benefits also that Jeffrey talked about of increasing health, depression, anxiety. Some of these problems are redefined from coming from inside oneself to recognizing environment and external factors for dealing with stress, anxiety, and negativity all through narrative therapy. Um, it also has proven effects on uh, decreased blood pressure, improved dietary habits, sleeping patterns, productivity at school or work. It can also reduce conflict and tension because we're having kind of, you know, teaching narrative therapy to students and adults lets them retell their stories um, and resolve both those internal and external conflicts with people on the outside. It also boosts our creativity um, when we retell stories through a different narrative. It helps us become more creative with our solution-oriented problem-solving skills, and that it increases engagement. Um, if you use this narrative therapy model, it requires the writer to not only retell their story, but take small steps to actually changing outcomes and patterns of behavior and thinking. One of the most important key things it does for us, which is why we've implemented it at Women Wonder Writers, is it increases empathy. Um, we're able to actually put ourselves in the shoes of other people that may have been at the heart of some sort of tension or conflict in our lives. So it actually asks us of ourselves to think about it from another person's viewpoint. And it, promote, it promotes reputation, whether you're an agency that wants to implement this. Agencies who promote social emotional learning tools to their staff, to their students, you know, care about the wellness of their companies. And so can actually improve your own um, technique and reputation. If it's something you're interested in, go ahead in the chat box again, put your email uh, and we'll give you a follow-up call, put your phone number. Um, my staff will be making reach outs tomorrow directly if you want to take part of Jeffrey's um, six hour um, training session at a reduced rate. And also don't forget also if you're interested in the right of your life to also let us know so we can make sure that you get um, to be one of the, the first 12 people before it goes public. Thank you so much for attending. It's wonderful to always see your faces, or at least um, see your names in the chat box. I'm going to end with uh, one particular quote. When you look at a person, any person, remember that everyone has a story. Everyone has gone through something, 
that has changed them. Thank you so much. This is the conclusion of the webinar and I look forward to seeing you at our next event. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. <laughs>